Hello, and welcome to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I am your host, Mr. Miller. This podcast will cover a number of topics that happened on this date in history. Please visit the podcast webpage at thishappentoday.buzzsprout.com. There you can download the notes page, which will help you organize the information, as well as develop your own ideas on how these events change the world around us. If you're interested in hearing more, please consider subscribing so you will not miss out on what happens tomorrow in history. Today is June 15th. The General Slocum disaster occurred on June 15th, 1904. This tragedy is much less well-known compared to the Triangle Swartwaste factory fire of March 25th of 1911 and the Titanic disaster of April 15th of 1912. Perhaps these two shocking events happening within a year focused people's attention elsewhere, but the aftermath of the sinking of the P.S. Slocum radically altered the German-American community and the Lower East Side forever. The P.S. Slocum, built in 1891, was a paddle boat or side-wheeler passenger ship. On June 15th, 1904, the ship carried 1,358 passengers plus crew. Chartered by the St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church for $350, the passengers came mostly from the German-American community of the Lower East Side. Excitement and anticipation filled the air. For the passengers, this would be the fun-filled day outside the city, and as the ship departed, it would be enjoyable to watch the shoreline as the ship made its way out to the north shore of Long Island. Most of the passengers were women and children. As the ship made its way up East River, good times turned bad very quickly. There have been varying accounts of how the fire started, but it spread rapidly within a half hour of leaving dock around 9 a.m. The panic was horrific among the passengers as they faced death by drowning or by being burned alive on the ship. It was a safe bet that most of the passengers could not swim, and the period clothing of the day worked well against them. For days afterward, bodies would wash ashore. Only 321 passengers survived from a total of 1,358. The final death count totaled 1,021. The next largest death toll in the United States would come decades later with 2,974 dead from 9-11. There would be miracle stories of survivors for the lucky few and a heartbreak for those who lost loved ones. It was widely reported that Captain William Henry Van Schaik would not bring the ship to shore for insurance reasons reasons. Instead, Van Shake steered the burning ship to North Brother Island. Van Shake would testify that gas tanks and lumber yards made landing near 130th Street, close to the Bronx, dangerous. Testimony that would follow in the days ahead established that there were few safeguards. Life je- vests were rotten, lifeboats were in the same state, fire drills were non-existent, and the crew was untrained to handle the panic that followed on board the Slocum. Eyewitnesses from the shore could see the boat burning and wondered why the captain did not come to shore. Quickly, the captain and Knickerbocker Steamboat Company came under the crosshairs of an investigation. Frank Barnaby, the president of the company, defended the actions of the captain and the crew. On January 27, 1906, justice was meted out to Captain Van Schaik by a jury of the United States Circuit Court. He was found guilty of criminal negligence that he had failed to maintain the fire drills required by law. Judge Thomas, the presiding judge, sentenced him to 10 years of hard labor. And what happened to the company that owned the ship and the director? The Knickerbocker Steamboat Company and Frank Barnaby escaped justice. Van Schaik would serve only part of his sentence at Sing Sing Prison. He received a pardon through the efforts of his wife from President William Howard Taft in 1911. Prior to the Slocum disaster, the German-American community was a vibrant and active neighborhood of working class and highly educated. The shock of losing so many loved ones, devastated families, suicides and depression resulted from such a loss, and many residents moved away. Other communities were impacted as well. There was a loss of life among the Jewish and Italian communities that had family members aboard the ship. Standing in Topton Square Park is a Tennessee marble obelisk dedicated to the victims of the General Slocum disaster. The fountain was erected in 1906 by the Sympathy Society of German Ladies. Etched into the marble are the words following. They are the Earth's purest children, young and fair. Congress in 1917, Congress enacted the Espionage Act on June 15th, two months after the United States entered World War I. Just after the war, prosecutions under the act led to a landmark First Amendment precedence. The Espionage Act of 1917 prohibited obtaining of information recording pictures or copying descriptions of any information relating to the national defense with the intent or reason to believe that the information may be used for the injury of the United States or to the advantage of any foreign nation. 
The act also created criminal penalties for anyone obstructing enlistment of the armed forces or causing insubordination or disloyalty in military or naval forces. Further, the Wilson administration determined that any written materials violating the acts or otherwise urging treason were a non-mailable matter. The Postmaster General, Albert Burleson, ordered local postmasters to report any suspicious materials. Along with Attorney General Thomas Watt Gregory, Burleson led the way in aggressively enforcing the Espionage Act of 1917 to limit dissent. By 1918, in actions that seriously threatened the First Amendment freedoms and likely would not be upheld today, 74 newspapers have been denied mailing privileges. In 1917, the socialist Charles Schenck was charged with violating the Espionage Act after circulating a flyer opposing the draft. In Schenck v. United States, 1919, the Supreme Court upheld the act's constitutionality, writing for the majority, uh, Justi Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., held that the danger posed during wartime justified the act's restriction on First Amendment rights to freedom of speech. The court upheld similar convictions under the Sedition Act of 1918, Frowerk v. United States in 1919, Debs v. United States in 1919, Abrams v. United States in 1919. Although Congress sealed, repealed the Sedition Act of 1918 and 1921, many portions of the Espionage Act of 1917 are still law. Daniel Ellsberg, a former defense analyst who leaked famous Pentagon Papers to the New York Times and other newspapers, faced charges under the Espionage Act and went to trial in Los Angeles in 1973. The judge eventually dismissed charges against him and his colleague Anthony Russo. Two former lobbyists for the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, the AIPAC, were charged with violating the Espionage Act of 1917 in August of 2005. The charges were ultimately dropped in 2009. In more recent years, former CIA analyst Edward Snowden was charged with violating the Espionage Act if he, after he leaked classified documents related to the National Security Agency's widespread surveillance program in 2013, beginning with The Guardian. Many news outlets published the information from the documents, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and NBC News. Snowden sought asylum in Russia but could, not, but could be prosecuted under these charges if he returned to the United States. In May 2019, a federal grand jury in Virginia issued an indictment against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and that in included 17 counts of violation of the Espionage Act for receiving and publishing classified documents. Three of these counts are based exclusively on the act of publishing, which have, some have said could be, have implications for U mainstream U.S. media publications who also sometimes publish classified material. And finally, in 1966, the world's first hover show had opened with news of a Ministry of Defense order worth one million pounds. The Admiral of the Fleet, Lord Mountbatten of Burma, opened the exhibition today, Wednesday, at Browndown near Godsport in Hampshire. It is expected to attract up to 4,000 official visitors by closing time on Sunday. The show is intended to promote and export sales of hovercraft. The government order is for two new prototypes, a fast patrol boat capable of 75 knots and a logistics support craft. Visitors to the hover show so far include representatives of overseas shipping, shipping lines and ferry operators but the vast majority are military or naval experts. Results of the British military service trials of hovercraft in the Far East and Canada have been very encouraging. The MOD has confirmed that cross-channel SRN-6 hovercraft will be used to equip an army unit for service in the Far East in 1968. The SRN-6 model is currently operating on the cross-channel Ramsgate to Calais route. A bigger craft, the SRN-4, capable of carrying cars, is due to come into service in the channel in 1968. Hovercraft manufacturers BHC already have plans to build up a 4,000-ton freight-carrying hovercraft capable of speeds of up to 50 knots. While it has been designed for use as a fast destroyer or anti-submarine frigate, there is potential to develop a civilian freighter version for other passenger routes. The SRN-6, currently the largest craft in operation, cannot compete on price with ferries, but on a larger version, it would be able to undercut shipping on speed and air freight on cost. Another innovative project on show at Browndown is a hover train which uses air pads to run on an elevated monorail. The model, which has been designed by a team at Imperial College London, is capable of top speeds of 300 miles per hour or 483 kilometers per hour. You have been listening to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I thank you for listening and I hope that you have enjoyed learning about historical events from the past. Thank you to the following websites for their information regarding today's topics. 
thepeoplehistories.com, General Slocum Disaster, nypl.org, the Espionage of 1917 Act is passed at mtsu.edu, and the world's first hovercraft show opens at news.bbc.co.uk. The music used as the background track for this podcast is Americana, created by Kevin McLeod on Incompetech.com. If you enjoyed this information and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing, as this will keep the historical events in your feed in the morning for each day. I hope you have a great day.